Shalom, everyone, and welcome to Brit Am Messianic Synagogue's uh, Tuesday night study. And we're glad that you're here in person, those that are, and we're glad that you're watching online on the uh, Facebook page. Now, we're asking that if you're watching online, do us a favor and hit the watch party button so that you can share the study with everybody else that you know and share with your family and friends and other people will be able to participate in the study along with us. So go ahead and hit that watch party button. I also want to remind everybody that we are now operating the synagogue office again at the synagogue instead of from everybody's houses. And so if you need to come by the synagogue to take care of some business or to uh, ask for prayer or to different things, as long as you're not one of the people in a risk group that is not supposed to be around other people, uh, you're welcome to come by the synagogue. Also, if you want to make a donation, pay your tithes or offerings, you can drop that by the synagogue, or you can go to our website, shalompensacola.com, and right on the top it says donations. You click the donation button, and you can give right there. If you're on your cell phone, it'll walk you through how to give from your cell phone, or you can mail your donations in by just sending them to Brit on at P.O. Box 10943, Pensacola, Florida, 32524. And all of that information is on the website, so if you don't know, you didn't have a pen to write down what I just said, just go to our website, shalompensacola.com, and you can find all that information. Also, uh, tomorrow night we're having our Torah study. At 5.30, that will be on go to meeting still. As soon as the coffee shops open up where we can start having study at the coffee shops again, we'll do that. But for right now, all the coffee shops are still just pick up only. So we're going to continue having the Torah study on Wednesday night only at 5.30. And as soon as the coffee shops are opened up again, we'll be able to uh, begin having our studies back at the coffee shops. And we're looking forward to being able to do that. Um, Saturday morning, we'll have our foundations class at 9 o'clock and our regular Torah service, our Shabbat service at 10 o'clock. We will not be having any food either before for breakfast or after for one egg. Uh, we will have the nursery available for changing diapers and feeding, but not for nursery care. Uh, the parents can go in, take care of their child, and come back in the sanctuary. We're also sitting separately so those that are 51 and older are sitting on the north side of the sanctuary and entering from the north side of the building. And those that are 50 years and under are entering from the south side of the sanctuary and sitting on the south side. If you are 50 and under and have children, you sit on the south side. If you're 50 and over and you have children, praise God. <laughs> but still sit on the south side of the synagogue with your children. We're doing that because that's what our city has asked us to do as we abide by their recommendations. Uh, we're going to do that, and that allows us to be able to continue having services in our sanctuary instead of having to do everything online. So those are a couple of things going on. We want to remind everybody that uh, you can find out more information about all the things going on by going to our Facebook page or our website or our Twitter, or our Instagram, Instagram, and find all that stuff out. So with that in mind, we're going to go to prayer, and Lincoln is going to be teaching this evening. He's continuing his lesson on covenant relationships, and so I'm looking forward to him sharing that. I hope that's what you're teaching on, right? Yes, covenant relationships, and uh, so I uh, want to let you know that also, uh, last night I did a hashtag man wisdom seminar. It's available to watch on our Facebook page, uh, so you can go back and see it on, on the Brit on Facebook page if you missed it and share it with your friends. Um, prayer time. Please remember Robin and Fred. We're praying for Timothy. He's got some sores on his back that God needs to heal, and so we're praying for healing for him. Please remember Tom and Jane and also Tracy. Uh, Jerry and Jerry and Jerry and Sandy. Uh, all that's three Jerry's. I didn't stutter. We, we have three Jerry's that we always want to be praying for. Uh, and Sandy is married to one of those Jerry's. So we want to pray for, for them. 
Um, That's right, you're praying. So please remember to pray for Marquita and Robert. Uh, so those are some prayer requests. And if you're watching on Facebook and you have a prayer request, if you'll put the first name and what the need is in the comments, we will be praying for those also. So please go ahead and put that in there. Please pray for Michael. Uh, pray for Kathy. Both had losses in their families recently. We want to be praying for them. Uh, so, Abba, Father, we just thank you that you are active in our lives, that we are your children. You are not just the king of the universe that's sovereign over all things, but you're also our Father that loves us with a love that's beyond anything we can imagine. Father, you love us so much, and your word tells us that you desire to bless us. You desire to heal us. You desire to provide for us. That you are our provider. You are our healer. You are our redeemer. You are our strength. You are our shield. You are all of the things that we have need of. And Father, we just place these people and these needs in your hands, knowing that you are going to work to meet each and every one. And Father, we're thankful for those needs you've already met and for the testimonies that we've heard over the last few weeks of how you've been ministering and meeting needs and blessing and providing for your people. And Father, we just expect that you are going to continue to do that because that is your nature and character to bless, to touch, to heal, to restore, to deliver. And we're thankful for all this. Hashem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. I want to make two more quick announcements and then I'm going to turn it over to uh, Lincoln. The first one is I want to remind the men that unfortunately we had to cancel the Messianic Men's Conference with uh, and Jonathan Burnus was going to be our main speaker this year. Jonathan has, Rabbi Jonathan has committed to teach next year and be our main speaker next year. Uh, but because he can't travel, because he made commitments to his family to make sure that he stayed safe and he told me, he said, Eric, I'm not worried about getting sick. I'm not worried about all of those things. I travel to India and Africa and Russia and South and Central America. Travel all over the world to minister. But I made a commitment to my wife and my children that I would make sure that I stay healthy and well. And because I made a promise to them, I'm going to abide by my commitment to them. So he is able to come. And then also with the social distancing requirements, we would not, as the men of the conference, be able to sit around the tables and fellowship with each other, build up uh, camaraderie, and, and talk to each other and share what we thought about the left sessions and all that going on. It, we just wouldn't be able to do it, and the conference wouldn't be the same in that uh, nature. So we decided we would just postpone the conference until next year. So Rabbi Burnus will be here next year in May. It's a May 28th weekend, so make plans to do that. If you have already registered and you're watching this, you should already have an email that says all the information I just gave you, plus it gives you three options. First option is that you can just take your registration from this year and say, I want to go ahead and just register for next year, and we'll just transition it over and you'll be fully registered for the 2021 Men's Conference, Messianic Men's Conference. Uh, number two, number B, option B, uh, is just get a full refund. Let us know if you want a full refund, we'll give you a full refund. Option C is that if you want to, you can donate your registration this year to help offset some of the expenses that were used for the conference already this year. and. Uh, and just bless that one. So you'll be able to do either A, register for next year, B, get a full refund, or C, donate to our ministry to offset some of the expenses uh, that were already used uh, preparing for this conference. But now that the conference isn't happening, uh, those are still spent money. So those are your three options. Respond to the email and take care of that. And the last thing I wanted to say is that I put three t-shirts on uh, Facebook today. One of them says, religion isn't bad, bad religion is bad. And then quotes a verse from Jacob, uh, chapter 1, that says, pure religion on the Father. So there's that shirt. There's my rabbi shirt that I had on previously. And then there's the man, hashtag man wisdom shirt. Now, all three of these shirts are online. You can order them, and all of the proceeds from the purchase of those shirts is going to go to help people in our community that are 
have been affected by this stay-at-home policy. In other words, we have a lot of people that are working and they're only working part-time or, or they're not able to work at all and they're having to stay in their homes. And, and we want to use these proceeds to bless those people. So I'm not making any money off of it. The synagogue is not going to make any money off of it. All of the proceeds from these three t-shirts are going to go to bless people in our community that need a little helping hand during this time. So I just want to say those things, and now I'm going to welcome Lincoln up, and uh, he's going to share uh, his teaching. This is part two, or if you're French, part two, of covenant relationships. Well, thank you, Rabbi. This is uh, the Divine Plan for Marriage, Part 2, Divine Intimacy. And this is the topic of this one is actually shepherds. So, humans are sexual creatures. It's actually the second thing that the Lord tells us about humanity. It tells us that we are made in His image, and then it says that we're made male and female. And you can find that in Genesis 1, 27. Humans are social creatures. One of the earliest things that Adonai Tanit says about humans is that it is not good for a man to be alone. Ecclesiastes says that two are better than one, and a threefold cord is not easily broken. That's found in Ecclesiastes 4.12. And once there is a society, it's not enough for us to have one friend. Ladies, as nice as it is to think about your husband needing only you in the whole world, it's not realistic or biblical. He needs male friends, if for no other reason than to hear the same wisdom that you've been telling him come from another man. Adam spoke to God face to face, and with that, one was enough for Adam until he had children. But we need more for our connection to God is not as close because of the ravages of sin. Anyone with only one friend, one voice to listen to, will end up skewing their views to match up with that one voice. You may notice this with people who watch only one news source. Their views become very skewed toward the agenda of that one source. And fiction loves a vacuum. When we hear only one side of the story, we rarely come close to hearing the truth. On the other hand, those who spend time in prayer and Bible reading skew their views toward righteousness. However, those who spend time with God are more likely to spend time with others and hear multiple counselors. Abusive people, including the accuser, the enemy of humanity, seek to isolate. Our enemy knows that he can be far more effective at condemnation, temptation, and setting our feet on a circular path of blame and self-pity if there are no other voices that we hear. We need friends. Paul and Silas were traveling companions and fellow workers who worked very well together, and they were a powerful team. You can see an example of this in Acts 16, verses 25 through 34. David had a deep friendship with Jonathan. They understood each other and each respected the unique position that the other had. They looked out for each other and they presented a united front against one of David's most profound adversaries. You can see uh, information about uh, David and Jonathan in 1 Samuel uh, around chapter 18. Ruth was so impressed by Naomi's faith that she vowed to join with her for life, serving her faithfully and walking among her people. You can find that declaration in Ruth chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Throughout Scripture, there are many examples of people accomplishing great things and being blessed by God through their friendships. So if God can move through friendships and do great things, 
Should we all be single? Why do we need marriage at all? Well, let's just address the elephant in the room. The thing that separates marriage from friendship and communities of various kinds, including worship bodies, is sex. We like it. We were designed for it. Paul thought it was important. And God commands us to have marriage. Our friendships can have deep commitment. Our communities can be deeply caring and put us ahead of themselves. And our mishpachot may be communities of deep and abiding trust. But none of these can righteously fill the need that God has placed in each of us for physical intimacy. <coughs> Excuse me. The main reason that we need marriage is to keep intimate relationships righteous. And that's all intimacy, not just sex, but definitely including that act. Marriage is God's foremost picture of his relationship with us, but we don't need marriage to form goal-oriented or mutual interest partnerships. We need marriage covenant, because intimacy outside of that structure is destructive, soul entangling, and unrighteous. You've heard that Paul believed the single life was best, but is that really Paul's position? And even if it is, can we act on Paul alone? What about the rest of Scripture? What does it say? First, the modern interpretation of Paul's words, this lukewarm fondness for marriage as the indulgent second best option for those whose passions overwhelm their love for God, is nowhere to be found in Scripture. Instead, Scripture speaks of marriage as a joy and a blessing, speaking often of children as one of God's signs of pleasure. Second, I don't believe that Paul teaches singleness for all people either. In 1 Timothy 5, for example, Paul says that younger widows should remarry. Paul says that single people have a better opportunity to focus on the Lord and pray and seek the kingdom. But he doesn't say that married people can't. And he knew that a married couple can be a powerful force, as witnessed by Priscilla and Aquila and the work that they did. So since marriage is a blessing, and since marriage is largely rooted in protecting intimacy, especially the sacred place of the marriage bed, through all of our relationships, there is a need to preserve the reputations, the bodies, and the souls of courting couples. And how do we do that? How do we protect those reputations and relationships? We use chaperones. Dictionary.com defines a chaperone as a person, usually a married or older woman, who for propriety accompanies a young unmarried woman in public, or who attends a party of young unmarried men and women. So who makes a good chaperone? A good chaperone is someone who cares about at least one of the young people, uh, one of the, not necessarily young people, but one of you personally, and both of you as humans. Someone, upright and respectable, who can give competent testimony about your behavior together. Someone who values your reputation. Someone who is willing and capable of pulling either of you up short, verbally or physically, if you let your emotions or hormones get the better of you. And if you don't feel the need to have a chaperone, if you think your conduct around this person will not cause anyone to doubt their reputations, you should really reconsider marrying them. Remember, intimacy is the dividing line between deep friendship and a relationship that needs this covenant. And even if you may not have a drive that strong, your potential spouse might. And you could Marry someone who has an idea that you are going to have that drive after life, thinking you are simply well controlled. So this set of criteria eliminates a few people. 
Your kid brother, who isn't old enough to understand the point of marriage and courting, may not be able to focus on you enough to be a competent witness or responsible enough to give accurate testimony. It would be bad for your reputations to have him say, well, we went to the bowling alley, but I was in the arcade. I can't tell you what they did for two hours. Or if he thinks it's funny to say you were in the car talking for an hour, Sing with your age of aunt, her nods off at the table. She can't say what was happening during your time to You need someone like my wife's bestie, who encouraged us to talk about scripture and chided us when we made poor reputation choices. Not someone like another of our chaperones, who offered repeatedly to go into the other room so we could have some privacy, and had to be reminded repeatedly of the point of having a chaperone. So you might be wondering, how do I ask for a chaperone? Well, you should talk to people that you know who share your beliefs and faith. You should explain to them what you believe about boundaries, about reputation, and about marriage. You should ask them to pray for you and commit to protect your relationship. Be considerate and plan your outings with their schedule in mind. And if you don't know someone to ask, Talk to Rabbi or one of the elders of this congregation, and they can suggest someone you might ask. And they may be able to introduce you to somebody who, who can serve as a chaperone for you. So if you're asked to be a chaperone, how can you be a good one? How can you be a good chaperone? Well, if you've been asked to be a chaperone, here are some things you should keep in mind and put in practice. You want to protect the reputations of the, the couple involved, and you want to be able to testify to their righteous conduct. So maintain the rule of three. You should be present unless there are others in the room who can do the same. You want to protect the relationship and guide the couple toward righteousness. Discourage inappropriate actions and encourage self-control. You want to protect the marriage and help the couple make good decisions. Help them to guide their conversations toward things of value. There should be a balance between banter and fun on the one hand and deep topic coverage on the other. Both personality and compatibility are important. So, for both couples and chaperones, what are good ideas of things to do on dates? It should go without saying that a date should never include physical intimacy or intimate activities. If you wouldn't want another person doing this to your spouse, you shouldn't be doing it either until they are your spouse. A date shouldn't be thoughtless. And if your goal is entertainment instead of finding a spiritually compatible mate and, and winnowing out incompatible mates, you shouldn't do anything. Go out with a group instead. But if you have the right goal and a commitment to righteousness, what can you do on a date? The stereotypical dinner and movie is generally a bad date. Your discussion time is on the long end of the date, and your time together is largely wasted in focusing on something other than the person that you're supposed to be getting to. And while you're wasting that time, your subconscious mind is making all sorts of judgments about that with too little information. There are a great many outings that don't cost much and sometimes don't cost anything. Instead of dinner and a movie, try to plan a date like this. A stroll in the park while discussing important potential points of friction in the relationship, religious beliefs, and philosophical and political passions. Most disagreements are not insurmountable, but any disagreement can become a bone of detention. Any disagreement can become a bone of contention if it's not discovered beforehand. Visit an art gallery or a bookstore where you can talk about different works and how their themes match or counter your beliefs. 
And remember, the goal is to find disagreements, not confirmations. It's tempting to look for things that match up. Oh, isn't this wonderful? I like this, and he likes this, and I like this, and she likes this. But those things are not going to help you to build conflict resolution skills, and they're not going to help you find things that are going to cause friction and disagreements. Obviously, something attracted you to this person. Your job is to find the disagreement and deal with them, or move on to another potential spouse if the disagreements are too severe. Another idea is an evening board games. You can learn a lot about a person from how they approach games. My wife learned that I'm competitive and fair. She knows that when she wins a game with me, I didn't let her win. Or you can make dinner together. You'll get to see each other's level of cooking skill and talk about lots of different topics as you use herbs and spices and learn about the tastes your potential mate likes and dislikes. You'll find out if your mate, if your potential mate is from a leather tongue Viking who puts hot sauce on everything, or a wimpy window who doesn't want any spice. <laughs> but even if you are on those ends of the spectrum, that's not insurmountable either. <laughs> But doing things together that help you to talk about various and different things and find areas of disagreement will help you to make your relationship deeper and broader. And it will help you to learn more about each other and have a better foundation. Perhaps best of all for a date idea is to go to a Taurus suit together. Now this one requires some care because while Torah is the best thing to have as an you don't want it to become like a movie date, where you're seeing the movie but not learning anything about your date. The same goes for outreach volunteer work. Be sure the outing gives you enough time to get to know your potential mate, not just do the mitzvah. The mitzvah is great, but you're, the whole point of being in this place with this person is so you can get to know them. If you haven't found a potential mate, let me digress to say that outreach, while outreach might not be the best date, it can be a great place to meet like-minded candidates. You're probably noticing the theme here. All of these activities involve communication about things that matter. You'll be learning about your candidate on a deeper level than that given by most traditional outings. You'll be less likely to make emotional judgments that boil down to deciding which way to lean when the seat is too hard for how long you've been sitting at the movie. <laughs> I remember hearing a comedian talk about this, this decision. You're sitting in the movie, you've been there for about 45 minutes, and the seats are not really that comfortable, and so you have to move or your entire lower half is going to fall asleep. So you have to decide are you going to lean toward your date or away from it. And then you miss about 10 minutes of the movie while you think, if I lean toward her, is she going to think I'm being too forward? If I lean away from her, is she going to think I don't like her? <laughs> you get the idea. Be sure to consult your chaperone for date ideas, because they may have some useful ideas from their seeking time. If you protect the relationship with your potential spouse and are wise about the outings that you plan together, you'll be making a solid foundation for your marriage. If you're already married, consider contacting Rabbi to offer to be a chaperone for those who may need them. Your experiences can help others avoid mistakes that you made, or that you saw other people make, and can help them build solid marriages. Show up. Are there any questions? Yes. 
What was the worst date that you and Rivka went on? <laughs> Repeat the question for the people online. They can hear me. What I'm right here. What was the worst date that Rivka and I went on? <laughs> Doesn't let me see all the okay. comments on this one. Hold on. Yes. No questions, just comment. I thought it was very good, like really good. For those who were listening on the recording, someone said his teaching was very good. I wanted to share just in uh, a moment because uh, we have time left. We have about half an hour. Uh, I'm not going to take half an hour up, though. In that's, this. that's not my fault. It's because there aren't many people here to ask questions. It's, it's okay. <laughs> so, so here's the thing. Most people know about my wife and I, and that we went out on one date, and after that date, I asked her to marry me, and ten <laughs> days later, we were married. And because that is that portion of our story, there's a lot of people who think we didn't know each other before that first date. And then that we dated one time, I took her home, dropped her off, told her she was gonna marry me, and 10 days later we got married. That's not completely accurate in the scope of the whole picture, although that is accurate in that on our first date, I took her to the Golden Arches Family Steakhouse, which is a fancy way to say McDonald's. And then I, took her home after the, the evening was over and I did tell her she was gonna marry me and she said I was crazy and then the next morning she said she would marry me. She always <laughs> makes me say that whole part about me being crazy. Uh, but the truth is that we knew each other for about six months before our first date. And so we went out with our youth group and with young people and we went out in a group and we watched each other and we got to know each other uh, as part of a group before that came up. And I'm not going to tell the whole story uh, of, of how that happened, but, uh, but it, it wasn't that she just met me, went out on a date and said she was going to marry me. I had become a believer uh, just a few months before we started to go out with groups, not together, but in groups. We weren't dating, we weren't courting, we were just there. But she was watching me to see if I were, was going to be faithful to the Lord, how I was going to live my life. Because she had seen a lot of, uh, in her congregation she went to, it was very large and it had a lot of young people. And she had seen over and over and over where young men would come into their congregation and they would start dating the girls. And the girl thought, well, he'll change when I get married. Or I'll lead him to the Lord. Or his faith will get stronger if... You know, if I'll just push him along and, and lead him. And so Pammy was very careful to watch from a distance to see how I was going to be with the Lord before she even considered any kind of relationship with me. So I, I wanted to make that clear because a lot of times when we tell our story, we start with the first date and go on from there. Uh, but she was very careful about watching me as a new believer for months before there was any interest or any uh, relationship desire at all with, with her and, and so on. So 
it's important to know that the, that the story of our marriage, that we went on one date and then 10 days later we got married, begins about six months before that, when we were going out in groups and getting to know each other and, and having Bible studies together and prayer meetings together and spending time at the congregation together and all those kind of things. So there was a lot more that happened before that first date. And, and those are really important things. As a matter of fact, I know several people that have had almost total uh, virtual relationships um, with different things. And one of the advantages to that is that you get to have all kinds of discussions where you're not in a room with the person, where you're looking at them and your mind can travel to other things or you can you know, get too close or, or any of those things. So sometimes having that time to, to ask all the deep and important questions in an internet kind of relationship uh, is good. Uh, it's also good if you have somebody that can be involved chaperoning those conversations too. Because the internet in the usefulness of being able to ask and receive questions without having physical contact or physical presence also allows for the anonymity of being able to say things that you might not say if you were actually with the person. Uh, or do, you know, so, so be careful in that also as you go. Uh, it's important to, uh, and this is one of Catherine's favorite uh, sayings and verses, guard your heart. It's important to guard your heart in what we're and, and, and dealing with it. So put in safety, you know, what they call it, firewalls in your relationship that will be there to keep you not bound, but safe. Uh, so that's really important. So I did want to share that about Penny and I, because we do share the fact that we went on one date and got married 10 days later. But there was a whole six month period of time where we weren't dating, we weren't courting, we weren't spending time together with each other other than in big groups, but we were both watching the other to and, and, and fellowshipping with each other without. So we can ask all kinds of questions without getting to intimate questions uh, in those cases, and then we could uh, share those other things when we went on our first date to the Golden Arches and the State House, <laughs> and then during our long and exhaustive engagement of <laughs> 10 days. So, so that's important, and, and uh, it's because Pammy especially watched for that time that I think that we've been able to stay married and be married for nearly 39 years. When many of the friends that we had that got married around the same time that we did didn't last very long at all because our relationship was built on our faith, not on uh, intimacy physically or any of those things. So we were able to weather the storms because our, our center was God and not uh, the other things that get in the way sometimes. So, with that said, unless there are any questions online, uh, we're going to go ahead and close for the evening. Please remember to be praying for all those requests that were shared earlier, as well as I did notice there were a couple that were posted on our Facebook comments under this teaching. This teaching is going to be put on uh, our YouTube and all tomorrow, so you'll be able to see it there beyond just the Facebook pages. So thank you for joining us this evening, and uh, thank you for joining us online. Shalom.